Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water but roasted over the fire with his head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. 
You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is now, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and je jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to command. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you're going not to listen to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of the two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. These words of St. Paul's about love are often viewed with a kind of sentimentality as we imagine a world not bound by multiplying lists of duties, promises, or legal guardrails, but simply by good intentions. Or we feel relief thinking, oh, so long as my motivations are right, my actions are covered even if things fall flat. But I think that's a pretty limited view of what love is. When we consider our other readings this morning, I think we should be sobered. Exodus has the Israelites eating hastily and marking their doors with lamb's blood to prevent a real life or death judgment upon all the firstborn of Egypt. Jesus addresses the reality of someone who is supposed to be a fellow believer crossing boundaries and doing wrong to us. And the Apostle Paul feels the imminent coming of God's righteous judgment, hoping to spare the Christians in Rome from the fate he sees will befall those bound up in the most notorious of sins. No, our readings today don't give us the luxury to see love through rose-colored glasses. We need a love that's made of tougher stuff than good feelings, being nice, or meaning well. We need a love that recognizes that we need concrete action. Thoughts and prayers are nice, But if they don't produce real justice, real mercy, real forgiveness, real peace, real forbearance, we can't call it love. 
Now, it's worth noting that Paul is talking about the second half of what we often in the Anglican Episcopal world call the summary of the law. And this is where Jesus tells us that loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves are the two commandments on which hang all the law and the prophets. Liturgically, it has often been preceded by the confession of sin in most prayer books on those Sundays when the Decalogue, log, the, the Ten Commandments, weren't being used. It's only now in our 79 prayer book that it's become a little bit more occasional. And I feel this is sad because Jesus makes a pretty big point of both loving God and loving our neighbors. We need these kinds of regular reminders in our worship and in our prayer time so that we can keep our focus sharp on what is most important. At this point in Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome, he has already built up a pretty solid case for responding to God with a love-filled faith. He's driven home both our need for and promise of rescue from sin and its devastating effects through Jesus. Instead of deceiving ourselves into thinking we can cobble our own way into God's favor. So by the time we end up in chapter 8, which is about halfway through the letter, we're looking at how love for God exercised by faith becomes obedience to his will and showing genuine hands-on love for others. Love that doesn't depend on how we feel in the moment or some sense of kinship or positive vibes or a tit-for-tat consumeristic way of interacting with other people. Love is seeking what's best for others no matter what. In helping professions like medicine, teaching, and chaplaincy, compassion fatigue is real. I've seen doctors wither at the thought of sending a patient home knowing darn well that they will most likely not follow up treatment advice and wind up back there in the hospital just a few days later. Teachers deal with struggling students and they worry about whether or not their parents are actually going to feed them the not, that night or if they're just going to go out on another bender. And I come across people with a stiff upper lip still entangled in emotional, spiritual, and practical struggles and decide that they don't even want to vent. To give themselves a chance for a caring, non-judgmental ear that might at least help them just get things off their chest. It's easy to not want to keep offering people help who have intractable difficulties, besetting sins, and emotional damage that causes people who offer help to wonder why are they not grabbing hold of this help? And in reality, these are poor souls whose inner reserves are usually tapped out themselves. And that takes more energy from us, who care for others, perhaps making it difficult to really do the loving thing instead of just wiping our hands of these wonderful people made in God's image. But Paul, echoing Jesus, is not calling us to some namby-pamby vision of love as wistful feelings, wishes to be warm and well-fed, or token actions based on our comfortability more than another person's need. 
Paul doesn't say love replaces the law. Love fulfills the law. You may remember when Jesus talked about a series of topics on the Sermon of the Mount. Each time he brings up a point of the law, he doesn't replace it. He actually adds a motivation to it. You heard it said, don't kill. But I say, don't even hate them or speak maliciously to them. You heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say, don't objectify others, seeing them as something merely to fulfill your lust. That captures a bit of the gist of what Jesus was saying. Love is the motivator to real action. Love is the genuine compassion that prioritizes what's best for others over our own petty wishes. Love is the hands-on expression of who God is and how God demonstrates his care for us by suffering, dying, forgiving, and bringing new life from that which was dead in our lives. At Mayo, we often hear or read on our computer screens, the needs of the patient come first. And I think this is a helpful corrective to every one of us who are there when we are tempted to just coast. There's always a balancing act of triage, trying to prioritize who to see, what can be done realistically, when to refer to others on the team, when questions come up that are beyond one's own scope of care, and so on. But in the moment, with that patient, that person, that is the most important person in the room. And there's no telling who is suffering spiritually just by looking at a list of medical indicators. Someone who has cancer all through their body, kidney failure, congestive heart failure, maybe coping well using good spiritual practices of prayer, leaning on family and friends, even keeping a gratitude journal. The person in the next room over might be someone having routine gallbladder surgery and they're terrified because it's their first surgery and they don't have any family that, they, that are nearby that they can come see them and it's their first chance that they've ever they've ever had surgery and oh my goodness there's they don't have a church that they belong to so i might have a short sweet chat with the cancer patient while engage in deep exploration of what's meaningful and gives hope to the surgical patient with the prayer for peace of mind but in both those instances that person is who is most important when I'm with them. I focus on that person and their family if they're present, giving whatever I can. I show Christ's love with emotional and spiritual support, then contacting the right person for follow-up for other needs, medical questions, social service concerns, even just getting a warm blanket. Love is going to look different for each of us and what we can actually do. So what might love look like? Genuinely keeping someone in prayer and not just saying, I'll keep you in prayer. Helping a stranger in need, even if it's inconvenient. Being genuinely friendly to people who show up on Sunday and when maybe you bump into them later on that week in the community. Keeping a complaint over a personal preference silent with the charitable thought that maybe someone else appreciates what I don't like. Speaking up when someone mistreats others instead of just minding my own business. 
taking a risk to invite some of the church because you think that there's something about Jesus or Christ Church or just the feeling of being here that you think is worth sharing with someone else. Of course, love can be simpler than we give credit for. We may think we have to whip up an emotion or make a major contribution or ensure that there's no mixed motives before taking action. But for most of us, behaviors and decisions come before feelings. That's one of the foundational premises in most psychological therapies. The good thing about love is that it isn't an emotion from a biblical perspective. It's an orientation. It assumes you want to do what's best for you and turns that motivation outward to doing what's best for God and other people. And wonder of wonders, taking a moment to put our own wishes to one side for just a moment for someone else ends up becoming quite fulfilling in the long run. So yes, love's not a perfect system because we're all works in progress. We're all ordinary sinners in need of extraordinary grace. And that's good because we're all in the same boat. No room to feel self-righteous when I accept that I can't do life without God and other people. And I sure have plenty of inner growth for the Spirit to cultivate in me. We may find ourselves having to do what we can to rescue those closest to us like the Israelites before the Exodus. We may find ourselves in a world that seems to be getting worse, like Paula was imagining, which seems to actually feel that way with age. I guess trash piles up in our souls over time. We may find that we are wronged by someone, as Jesus describes, or maybe we're the ones who wronged someone else. And so we need to be open to reconciliation. It's incumbent upon us. Love is not easy, but it is the only way our Lord gives us to live a life worth living, both in this life and the new creation to come. And when we love, we are tapping into the very essence of who God is, meaning that there's no limit to what love can do. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have taught us that without love, whatever we do is worth nothing. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts your greatest gift, which is love, the true bond of peace and of all virtue, without which whoever lives is accounted dead before you. Grant this for the sake of your only Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven.
We will start first with our Trilog prayer. Lord, it is your voice that calls each of us to play our part in the story of your church in Wisconsin. For you have made us for your purpose of revealing love and a challenging time in a divided world. As our three dioceses discern becoming one, continuing to seek your will for us, enlighten our hearts to know what things we ought to do, enlighten our minds to know what things we need to leave behind, enlighten our spirits to embrace a future none but you know. Give us peace, give us courage, give us hope, and give us perseverance to make the necessary steps to continue to follow your lead. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, especially our parish families. Jane, Mary, Pat, Eric, Ricky, Matthew, Gavin and Emerson, and George and Cindy, and for those celebrating birthdays, especially Julian, Lucas, Naz, Nosy, Marcos, Abigail, Daniel, Vivian, Sibby, and the anniversary of Michelle and Andrew. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Matt, our bishop provisional, Mike, our rector, Father Lenny, Deacon Bill, and all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in all the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble and give them healing and comfort, especially Amy, Anne, Anne, Barbara, Bill, Burley, Colum, Chip, Cole, Dick, Ed, Jennifer, Joe, Julie, Ken, Marion, Mary, Mariah, Phyllis, Tim, Tim, and Vivian. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. Lord, hear the prayers of your people and what we have asked faithfully. Grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand.
The peace of the Lord be always with you. Do we have anyone celebrating any birthdays or anniversaries today? Well, let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice unto God. There's a change in the anthem, and I usually share the words so that people have a a little better idea of the words we're singing. Sometimes they're hard to see, see it's hard to hear because we're back behind the, the altar there. It's, this is, uh, the change is, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. I'll just read you the first words, the first verse, but I will we'll, uh, kind of give you a hint that there's a little bit of swing to this, um, uh, to this tune, and if you don't understand the second verse or the third verse, you can be thinking about, you know, what are the, what are the blessings of this place and your being here today? So first verse will be, and then there's a chorus. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet Heavenly Dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll leave. Without, without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we leave this place. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one, tomorrow is our first Monday back for Free Coffee Monday at uh, UWL. Uh, Mary, the new pastor for our campus ministry, was here last week. A couple folks had a chance to meet her. Uh, so anyone uh, is welcome to stop for Free Coffee Monday uh, on 1334 Pine, where we are right across from the Health Sciences uh, Building every Monday morning from 8 to 10. Uh, it's great for us to meet students and be able to give this little bit of uh, love to them. Uh, also, tomorrow there is a, a September 11th commemoration ceremony, which is um, out on French Island at Plainview Park at 6 p.m. The public is welcome to join us. And lastly, uh, next week we'll start our first Sunday school uh, session for the teens and children. And uh, we are always looking for extra folks who are willing to be um, a second adult in a classroom. Every classroom needs to have two adults. You don't need to teach, but we need to have two adults to be able to comply with Safeguarding God's Children uh, protocols in our diocese. So thank you so much.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life, you made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night in which he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the very blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.